I'm here to talk about radical Islam. Radical Islam are the people that I work with. I'm a radical. I'm just like them. As much as that may bother you, don't let it. Because I do much the same thing they do. And I get many of my cues from my radical Muslim friends. And I find that they are the best ones to teach us how to be passionate Christians. Because most of my radical, my radical Muslim friends are willing to die for what they believe. How many of you are willing to die for what you believe? I want to see all your hands up there. A number of years ago, one of the most radical, and considered to be the most radical cleric, Sheikh Omar Bakri Muhammad, a good friend of mine, I've got to know him in 1993. I've been in Britain since 1992. So the, uh, the year after I was there, I went to one of his talks, and I realized that whenever he came onto campuses, at that time I was permitted to go on campus and speak, and, and any time I would go onto a campus, I would go right into the Islamic society, right to their groups. And usually I was the only white person, certainly the only non-Muslim in those groups, and I would just ask damaging questions at the end of the talks. And there were only maybe 20 or 30 Muslims in those groups. When Sheikh Omar Bakri came to town, these groups suddenly jumped to three to four, sometimes 500. And they had to use halls like this to accommodate him. He had an enormous amount of electricity. He had an enormous amount of passion. And I was attracted to him. And I could see why these young men, these young Pakistanis, mostly Indian Pakistanis, Bangladeshis, why they were attracted to Sheikh Omar Bakri Muhammad, who is from Syria. He had tried to overthrow the government in Syria, had to flee to Britain. Everybody comes to Britain when they want to flee. And he come to Britain, and they put him up there in Tottenham. And he was known as the Ayatollah of Tottenham. And he had his own car. He had his own house. He had all his kids were provided free schooling, free medical, all provided by the government. That's why we needed to get out of Europe. Oh, forget that. Let's come back to Sheikh Omar Bakri Muhammad. Sheikh Omar Bakri Muhammad, I got to know him, and I wanted to get to know him, and we got to became good friends. And he invited me to go and speak at one of his classes in Tottenham. So I went there, and he introduced me this way. He said, this is my favorite Christian, but this will be the first man I kill when Islam comes to Britain. What an introduction. <laughs> and that's exactly, and I had no problem with that because I would be the first man he kills. They would have these huge rallies for Islam at Trafalgar Square there in central London. They would take over the entire square, five to 6,000 Muslims there. And they would take over the Nelson's column and get up on side it, and they would have all these banners about the Khilafah is coming to Britain. Are you ready for the Khilafah? And they wanted to instigate and start the Khilafah in Walthamstow in North, uh, North East London. I would go to these meetings and many times, a uh, number of times he would see me and so he'd have me get up onto the plinth with him and we'd have impromptu debates right there on top of the plinth. One day he was up there and he said, Mr. Smith, why is it you don't want the Khilafah to come to Britain? Now, I don't know how many of you have been to Trafalgar Square, but I immediately started looking around me and I wanted to say, and I said, let me tell you why I don't want the Khilafah to come to Britain. Say, so look right in front of us there. There is the National Gallery. Inside the National Gallery are 2,000 years of Christian art. If the Khilafah came to Britain, you would throw out all that art. Anything, any images of any of the prophets, you would destroy, including images of my Lord Jesus Christ. Over here is a road that's called, I just lost my sound. Can you still hear me? Shaftesbury Avenue. And on that are all these old old second-class, second-hand bookstores, hundreds of them that are critical of religion, critical of Christianity, critical of Islam. I said, you would destroy every one of those books. You would burn them all. Right next to us is St. Martin's of the Field, that beautiful church where some of the most beautiful music has been recorded. It has certain, it is considered to have perfect pitch. And I say, in that building, you would shut down that building, you would shut down that music because much of the music that's recorded there is praising Jesus Christ, my Lord. Over to the right of me here is Fleet Street. Used to be where all the newspapers had their headquarters. Now they've moved over to Cannery Wharf. But back in the, those days, they had their headquarters there. And I say there are some of the best newspapers in the world who were critical of religion, critical, yes, of everything. They, we have that freedom to be critical here. You would shut down those newspapers and not let them be critical of Islam. Back behind me is Buckingham Palace. But before you get to Buckingham Palace, there's Whitehall. 
the seat of our government, democratic government, one of the best democratic governments on earth. And we can see that what just happened yesterday. There's an example of that. You would not allow democracy to exist. You would bring the Khilafa, which does not allow man's law. It would be a dictated by a theocratic state with Allah at the top, underneath which became the Caliph, under which would come the, the ulama, under which would come the Uba, under, under which would come the people of the book, the Ali Kitab, and at the very bottom, the Kufar. And you would have destroyed the democracy that we have here and replace it with a theocracy. Then there's Buckingham Palace just behind me and to the left. This is the identity of the British. This is their monarchy. You would destroy the monarchy. Then over there on that side, just over those buildings, is a place called Speaker's Corner, where I'm every Sunday. Sunday afternoon. The bastion of freedom of speech. For 160 years, that has remained the bastion of freedom of speech. You would shut that down overnight. Freedom of expression in art. Freedom of expression in literature. Freedom of expression in music. Freedom of expression in criticism. Freedom of expression in government, in one's identity, and freedom of speech. That's why I don't want you to come to Britain. And he asked me to leave the stage. I just had to look at all those beautiful buildings all around me. Because see, this is what Islam has done for 1,400 years. For 1,400 years, it has always come, taken over a culture, dominated it, introduced its own dress code, its own social mores, its own political structure, eradicated every culture that was there and replaced it with its own. And we're seeing that even today with ISIS, Al-Qaeda, Boko Haram, Al-Shabaab, Jamaat Islami. You want me to go on? There are so many of these groups that are now popping up all over. And these are the groups I have to confront. These are the groups I have to take on. And these are the people I love the most. Because they want what I want. They want to know God. They want to submit to God. They want to obey God. They don't know the other translation of the word. And for 24 years, we've now been in Britain confronting these radical Muslims. Now, the missiological in the church has a, had a real problem with radical Islam. They don't know what to do with radical Muslims. There is a real apathy that's really pervasive in the church all over. And we're finding in every church I go, I see really one of two camps. There's two ways of responding with radical Muslims or even orthodox Muslims, or should we say the real Muslims. There's the one group that's over here that believes the best way to deal with Muslims is to befriend them. Friendship evangelism, grace method, and there's all kinds of these what we call ironic approaches. They're beautiful. There's nothing wrong with them. In fact, we use them. I use them all the time. We need to start. We need to have friendships. Please don't stop that. The difficulty with this group over here is they don't go far enough. Because what happens when you open your mouth and you say, and I tell to all my students whenever I send them out, I say, do two things. Whenever you meet a Muslim, say two things. Say that I believe that Jesus is God. I believe the Bible is the Word of God. Do you have an opinion? And you may get three hours of opinion from just those two statements. Because when you look at Christianity and Islam, it all comes down to those two paradigms. It all comes down to the book and the man. Jesus. And the gospel. Now, for many of those over on the right, they don't want to get to that. They're fearful of if they open their mouth and say that they believe Jesus is God, that that will shut down that relationship, that will shut down that friendship. And so very rarely do you ever move to the gospel. And when they do finally introduce what they're all about, suddenly they get a plethora of question after question after question after question. How could one plus one plus one equal one? How do you know that the Bible that you have is the Word of God. And how can you say that you have the Word of God when you don't even have any of the original manuscripts like we have? Who started Christianity? Was it Paul or was it Jesus? How could God have his son? How could God enter time and space? How could God corrupt himself? All these great questions that many of us don't have answers to because we don't teach this kind of material in our Bible schools. There's no school. I don't know of any school here in the United States. Maybe I'm wrong. Do you teach Islamic apologetics here? Can you name me one school that does? I can name you two. Biola used to in California. Southeastern Seminary still does, I think. We don't have any in Europe. I know they are in Australia, finally. 
But we don't teach that. We teach all kinds of apologetics, but not Islamic apologetics. In almost every seminary, there is a class on how do you talk about the existence of God. Well, the Muslims don't have a problem with that. How do you deal with suffering? Well, they usually cause it. And what do you do with the authority of Scripture? That's the only one that really is relevant to this equation. We're way behind them when it comes to apologetics. Nothing is out there on Islamic apologetics. I have a degree in, in apologetics, a master's in apologetics. I was never taught anything about Islam. I even have a degree from Fuller Seminary on Islamics. I was not taught any apologetics at Fuller Seminary. When I got to London and I went down to Speaker's Corner the first time in 1992, I got whipped. I was humiliated. I went back home. I never wanted to go again. Thank God for my wife. She kicked me out the door the next week and has been kicking me out every time for the last 24 years. She has never been down there when I'm there in 24 years. <laughs> but she kicks me out the door every Sunday. Goodbye, honey. Don't talk about it until you come home. Sometime I come home with blood on my shirt. We get beat up at Speaker's Corner. We get hammered, especially in the 1990s, but not since 2001. Suddenly, after 2001, Islam was a religion of peace. Salam, peace. Alan, that's where we need you, Alan, to go and tell them what really Islam means. But we've been doing this now for 24 years. I've been doing it for 24 years. And what's been fascinating is this radicalization that I saw beginning in 1993. Well, it wasn't really beginning, but I was there because I was asked to come to Britain for that very reason. Now, to get to Britain as a missionary, you have to wait a year and a half to get a visa. So when I went there in New York City to, into the consulate office or the British Embassy uh, to get my visa, I was expecting to just get an interview that would take on a year and a half for me to finally get my missionary visa. As I sat down in front of the consulate, the man asked me, why should we allow you to come to Britain? I said, well, you need me. He said, why do we need you? He says, because you have a growing radicalism, especially in London, in Leicester, in Birmingham, uh, there uh, in your northern cities, uh, you don't know how to deal with this radicalism. And I said, I'm a, I have a master's in apologetics, another one in Islamics. I know how to do apologetics. I really did at that time. I was lying, of course, because now I know I didn't know anything at, at all. But he didn't know that, and I didn't know that. I said, you really need my help. And he looked at his watch, and he said, if you have about 45 minutes, I'll get it to you before you leave. So I walked out of there with a visa for my whole family because he realized, this man realized back in 1992 that they had a problem with radical Muslims. And he was the first one to admit it. I think God spoke to him that day. But that was back in 1992. Now, when I got whipped the first day at Speaker's Corner, I went back and I was humiliated. I didn't know what to do. I didn't have Sam Shamoon there to help me out. I didn't have David Wood there to help me out. These guys hadn't, been, but hadn't even been born, I don't think. I don't know how old you are, Sam. You have to be careful what I'm saying here. But they were still in diapers at the time that I was being whipped and welded. So they weren't good, much good at that time. And we didn't have anybody to help us out. We had John Gilchrist was the only one that we could go to. And he had done an amazing job with Ahmed Didat down in South Africa. And we get these little pamphlets to try to help us with these, these arguments. But there was no school to go to. There was no internet to go to. There was, no, there was nothing. There was nothing at all. We just had to do it by the seat of our pants. And so we made mistake. And I don't know how many Allahu Akbar's I had in my face. Because every time I got something wrong, they yelled Allahu Akbar. But you know, it's amazing how when you have Allahu Akbar yelled at your face, you don't forget that question the second time. I can even remember some of the faces of the men who yelled it at me. And every time that question comes up, I can remember the face. Oh, yeah, this is Abu, Abu Lahab. This is what he said. I remember the answer now. And it's amazing how it, 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 it forces you to memorize names, dates, places, events. You have to do that at Speaker's Corner because you have no books. You have no computer. You have nothing in your hand except your head. And so we started back there in 1992. There was only five of us. I was the only one that had any Islamic work. The one man that really helped me was a man named Dr. Paul Blackham, and he was, had his, he was doing his doctorate at that time. He had an eidetic memory. Do you all know what that means? Photographic memory. So everything he read, he memorized. He didn't forget anything that he read. He could even tell you the page number that he read it on. He was doing his doctorate at King's College on the Patristics. But he realized that the best way to learn his patristics is to come to Speaker's Corner and get hammered by the Muslims to learn the answers. So he would tell you, and he still does today, I got my doctorate at King's College, but I learned my theology at Speaker's Corner. Because there's hundreds of Muslims down there every Sunday. 
And they come from all over the world, but the best and the brightest are there. And the best and the brightest all come out of the Indian subcontinent. They're the Pakistanis and the Indians. They're way ahead of everybody else in Islam. And you can see why. Just look at their numbers. Look at the Muslims living in Pakistan, India, and Bangladesh. Add up their Muslim populations and you get 500 million. That's twice the entire Arab-speaking world. Yet nobody's going to, the, to deal with Muslims in Pakistan, India, and Bangladesh. No one. And yet that's where I was born. That's where I grew up. That's why I think the Lord called me to work amongst this group. Now, back in 1992, we didn't know what we were doing, the five of us, and we got humiliated over and over again, and that we learned from that. We kind of created our, our apologetics by the seat of our pants. And we get bloodied many times. We come back and do it again. And each time we got better and better, and we just started really creating our own apologetics. We hadn't really heard about polemics yet. I didn't even know the word existed. We hadn't really gone the other direction because we had no model of that. There is no model of polemics. There's no school that teaches it. Most of you don't even know what I'm talking about. Do you all know what polemics means? Raise your hand if you don't. There's my seat. Polemics is the opposite of apologetics. Polemics is going the other direction. It's much like your football team. It's really easy here in America because you have a, a, a American football. I don't know what it has to do with football because we really have the football in Britain. I don't know why you consider that to be football because it never hits the foot except once or twice. Anyways, you've got this American football team and you've got both offense and defense, don't you? So your defense would be, well, they're the ones that make sure the others don't score against them, right? So you need a good defense. And the defense would be your apologists in Christianity. That's what we do well. We're pretty good at apologetics, except for Islamic apologetics. Am I correct? You have a whole different net, a set of skills for apologetics. To be a good apologist, you better know your Bible. You better know your Christology. You better know the divinity of Jesus Christ and how to defend it. You better be able to defend the Trinity in three minutes. How many of you can do that? And that's why apologetics is something we really need. We need to start introducing into our seminaries and our Bible schools Islamic apologetics. That's defense. But you don't win games in American football by just defense. You need your offense as well, don't you? In fact, your offensive team, sometimes they are the more popular players. They are very, usually the better paid players, and they are the ones that go the other direction. They confront the others, and they are the ones that have a whole other set of skills. Different set of skills than the apologist or the defense. And in Christianity, the offense would be polemics. But if you're going to be a polemicist, you better know your Quran. You better know Muhammad. You better know about Allah. You better know about the whole history of Islam. You better know about the traditions. You better know about the tafsir. You better know about the hadith, the tahrik, and you better know about the sirah. Those are the things you better know. And how many of us know of any of those? What school is teaching this? There's no school anywhere that's teaching Islamic polemics. There's a fear of teaching polemics. But I've had no problem of hearing Christians that learn all about polemics when it comes to Jehovah Witnesses, when it comes to Mormons, when it comes to atheists. Yo, you have all kinds of material on how to confront the atheists. Yes, you do. And the Jehovah Witnesses. You're using polemics all the time. But somehow you don't want to use polemics when it comes to Islam. Why? And whose agenda would that be? I've heard everywhere, ever, even at Fuller Seminary, you never ever confront the Quran and you never confront Muhammad. Whose agenda is that? Who do you think created that agenda? Well, that's the Muslims. Because you go to any Muslim country, those are the two things you may not confront on pain of death. It's a capital offense in most Muslim countries to confront the Quran and confront Muhammad. So we've inculcated that and we've now used that and imbued it in all of our methodology. So we don't have polemics at all. It doesn't exist. Nowhere. Is it taught on any, in any school that I'm aware of? And so we had to learn that the hard way. We learned it in 1993, and then in 1994 something happened. I started taking a course at School of Oriental and African Studies there in London, at the University of London, and I studied under a man named Dr. Gerald Hotting. Gerald Hotting is the one that probably did the best job of amalgamating what this, this new historical critique, the same kind of criticism that were leveled against the Bible in the 1800s at well, with Wellhausen and the Tübingen School in Germany. That material that was used there on historical criticism, on literary criticism, redactic source, all these criticisms that we've all grown about and we've all learned in 
seminary, he was now using on Islam. In fact, he, when I first went to his class the first day, he said, you know, I had spent 20 years confronting the Bible, redactically, with source, literary criticism, you name it. He did every one of the criticisms, and he says, we couldn't find any new material. It's pretty much all been answered. But we had all the skills, plus we had all the languages, because Islam shares many of the same languages that Christianity and Judaism share, because it's from the same part of the world, the same archaic languages. So he said, I'm now then, the last 20 years, I've been now looking and been using this material against the Quran. And what I'm going to share with you now for the next, I think it was 40 weeks, is what we have found. There were 50 people, 50 students in that class. Within two weeks, 25 had left, all of them Muslims. Many times slamming the doors as they left. And I could see why. Because he was coming up with questions I never heard about before. I never heard this material before. He was the first one that taught me that there was a problem with the life of Muhammad, that we have no record of his life at all in the century that he lived. We have no record of his life at all in the century after he lived. In fact, the first record we have of Muhammad's life does not get written down till 833, yet he died in 632, 200 years later. Ooh, I never heard that before. Then he started showing me what we were finding, and he was saying, look at these artifacts that we're starting to see. Look at this big building called the Dome of the Rock. It has no Qibla. Wait a minute, the third holiest shrine in Islam and it has no Qibla, no direction of prayer? Well, he was wrong. Actually, it does have a Qibla, but we now know that only because of Dan Gibson. It does have a Qibla. But it doesn't, it's not in here, it's not there, it's not, there's no niche in the wall, there's no mihrab to show the Qibla. And what he thought at that time was that the, if there was a direction of prayer, it was probably towards Jerusalem. Little did he know that the Qibla is not towards Jerusalem. But at that time, these Muslims, they were getting infuriated. They had never heard this before. They were yelling at him. And poor Dr. Hotting, he was just the nicest gentleman. He didn't know how to deal with this. So I said, can you mind, is it okay if I take some of this stuff down to speaker's corner? And he said, please don't do it. I said, listen, I won't quote you. I'll just use your material. <laughs> so I started going down to speaker's corner. And of course, back then I was not up on any ladder. I was just in the crowd. And I started talking about it in the crowd. And the Muslims got mad. By 1995, they, had, they got fed up. And one day I got beat up, I was knocked unconscious. 60 Muslims surrounded me, they started kicking me. I don't know what happened, left, 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 what happened after that. What I was told was a big black man came and lay down on top of me and took my blows. By the time the police got there and got, pulled all the guys off of me, the black man had disappeared. I never got to thank him. A few years ago, I was doing four debates, four half an hour debates on the ladder with four different Muslims that had come from different countries just to debate me. They come from all over the world just to debate me, these impromptu debates. We call them five minute debates. I go for five minutes, so they go for five minutes. Five minutes, five minutes, five minutes, five minutes, five minutes. It's great fun because we can go for two hours. They run out of material after 15 minutes. Our material is so good now that we can do that. And I had just done these four debates. I had got off the ladder and some Arabs, they started punching me. I started getting really whipped. And suddenly another big black man just came, put his arms around me and says, let's go, Jay. And he took my blows. When we got outside the crowd, I turned around to thank him and he just disappeared. What do you think? Who do you think that was? Ooh, we have a great God. A number of years ago, there was a man named Mubin. He had come from Shabir Ali's organization, had from Canada, to come to England to find a wife. I don't know why. I think they have pretty good ones in Canada. But he wanted to come and find one in England. And Shabir had said, when you come to England, go to London and make sure you go and see Jay Smith. He's a good friend of mine. At that time, we'd, we'd debated about four or five times. So he came down to Speaker's Corner to look for me. He was in the crowd. I didn't know he was there. But one of my people on my team was in the crowd with him. And so he said, is that Jay up there? He says, yeah, can I go and have dinner with you guys after? I said, yeah, let's go out for dinner. So he went out for dinner. His name was Mubin. And as I was introduced to him, I noticed that he would not look at my eyes and his hands were shaking like this and he would not look at me and I saw something was wrong so when we sat down I said Mubin what's wrong with you he said well, well didn't you see them I said didn't I see what you didn't see them I said what are you talking about the two men in the trees I said what two men in the trees see when you go down to speaker's corner we have big oak trees these big oak branches that cover over top of us and we we usually stand underneath them get up on a ladder underneath them and he says he said I said, describe what you saw. And he said, well, there were two men dressed in white sitting on the branch above you, smiling at you. 
And they scared me to death. And I said, Mubin, let me tell you what you just saw. I said, when I get up at 4 o'clock in the afternoon there in London, back in America, there are about 20 churches that are praying that I preach the gospel, praying that Muslims get affected by what we're saying, praying that I am safe and secure. I said, what you saw was an answer to their prayers. Those are two guardian angels. I've never seen them before. I never will see them. God doesn't want me to see them, but God wanted Mubin to see them so that when Mubin told me this, I would believe him because Christians are seeing angels behind everything, but not Muslims. And that's why when Mubin said that, I realized that God, every time we're on that ladder, there are two angels above me. I call them Harry and Larry. (laughs) And every time I get up on the ladder, I say, Harry, Larry, you ready? Here we go. Let's go for it. Protect me now. It's so much fun. When I got beat up back in 2004, 2005, 11 years ago, it was in the papers the next day. The police were quite upset because they knew just in a short amount of time I could be killed. And so they said, Mr. Smith, from here on out, you need to get up on a ladder. I said, well, I am not a speaker. I'm not a preacher. I've never, I did have homiletics. I failed it. And so I didn't know anything about it. And so they said, well, we need to see you at all times. So we're asking you to get one of these little kitchen ladders. That's all it is. Just a little kitchen ladder, just two chain, about as big as yours right there, tall as yours. That's why I feel real comfortable being above you right now, just to get so you're above the crowd so we can see you at all times. And I said, okay, I'll try it. And so I would stand there up on the ladder, and Dr. David, Dr. Paul Blackham would stand at the foot of my ladder, and he'd feed me all my material. This guy had an eidetic memory. I just held him to read this, now read that, now read that, and then just feed me. And it was great fun having him as, as my cohort. And so we went at it. And I introduced this historical material from the ladder for the first time. The Muslims could not take me off the ladder because the police were watching. So they said, let's have a debate. And so we decided to have a debate. I've never done a debate in my life. And so in August of 2005, I had my first debate at Cambridge University, Trinity College, with Dr. Jamal Badawi. Dr. Jamal Badawi is considered to be, at that time, he was the world authority on the Quran. And he had put out 340, I understand, videos on the Quran back in the 1990s. So when he flew in, we had this debate, and he was not expecting the material that I was going to use. All the material I was going to use was some of the material we introduced at the debate two days ago here on Wednesday. How many of you were at that debate two days ago? Some of the material on Mecca, on the Qibla, on Medina, on the problems with the, uh, with, with the early emergence of Islam that we introduced back in 1995. So we've been using this for 21 years. We talked, I gave him 10 historical challenges. He couldn't come up with one answer. And he was the leading authority in the English language on the Quran at that time. And I realized we had something here that could not be responded to. This is something they could not answer. And I thought, this is the Achilles heel of Islam, the historical critique. So in 1995, we put that up on our website, and it's still there. It's been there for now 21 years. And yet they cannot respond to those 10 arguments. Now, That was in 1995. From then on, we realized that we need to come up with lots of new material. So we created a group called Fander Center of Apologetics. Fander Center of Apologetics, and here's the brochure. If any of you want this brochure, you can come and get it to me later. But we decided to do what the early church did, because we find out that many of the mission agencies were just not going back to that early church model. They weren't going back to what Paul was doing. You remember good old Paul? Before he was Paul, he was Saul, wasn't he? And remember when he was Saul, he would go into, he would go and actually he, would, he was there at the, the stoning of Stephen. He was holding the clothes of those that were stoning Stephen. It said that he went and he killed Christians and he was on his way to Damascus when God met him in a dynamic way and made him from Saul into Paul. And I love when you t- do a comparison between Saul and Paul because when, what God did with Saul and made him into Paul, he didn't change much about him. He still had the same passion. He still had used the same methodology. He still had a huge knowledge of his scriptures. The only thing I can see different between Saul and Paul was he no longer used the sword. He no longer used violence. Oh, he did use the sword. He used this sword, but not the sword at his side. He didn't kill anybody after that. And what people haven't realized is that Paul is actually a very good model of what we should be doing today. But he's also very much like my radical Muslim friends. 
There's lots of parallels that when I look at my radical Muslim friends, I have to ask them and, ask, and I have to put them together and I look at them and I say, hold on a minute. When you look at these radical Muslim friends, they're very much like Paul, aren't they? And Saul, more, more like Saul. Saul wanted a theocratic state, so did my radical Muslim friends. Saul would use weapons and destroy anybody that got in his way, so would my Muslim friends. Saul was very clear that the word of God was sacrosanct and must be obeyed literalistically in every detail, so are my radical Muslim friends. Saul was willing to die for what he believed, so do my radical Muslim friends. There's a lot of parallels there between Saul and my Muslim friends. Let's just call him Abdul. Now, missionaries come to me and they say, yes, but they're such a small group. Don't worry about them. And in missiology, we have these two camps. We have that Irenic camp that I talked about earlier. And the Irenic camp, many of them believe that this whole idea with radicalism is something that is an aberrant, it's an aberration, it doesn't really belong in Islam, it's a very small group, it's, it's, uh, it's not really important, and it's not my people that we need to deal with, because they don't represent real Islam. They don't represent the Muslim that's next door. Have you heard this over and over again? And the Muslim next door ten, either is a neighbor, or maybe you're a greengrocer, and those Muslims never talk about what the radical Muslims are talking about over here. And I would suggest that's, suggest that's pretty true. And the reason why is because you haven't talked to them about theology. Why don't you talk about theology to your Muslim neighbor or to your greengrocer? And just mention something about Jesus and Muhammad or the Bible and the Quran and see what happens. But most people don't like to talk about those things. And what I was hearing over and over again, the same narrative that I was hearing in Britain, I'm sure it's here in the, same, in the States the same way, is that radical Islam really only began in 1948 with the creation of the State of Israel. So it's a reaction against the State of Israel. It's a political reaction uh, against the State of Israel. Since it's a political problem, it needs a political solution. And the church is not part of that solution. Therefore, it will not really need to be over here on the right where the radical Muslims are. Are you hearing this? I'm hearing this everywhere. That the vast majority of Muslims are in the middle the nominal group. And then there's a little few more over here on the left, the liberal group. Liberal, nominal, radical. After the atrocities in 2001, I think everybody woke up that there was a radical group that was quite in your face, and that's where you all came into this picture. But most people don't realize that radicalism existed long before 2001, and certainly long before 1948. If you want to see the roots of radicalism, you need to go right back to a man named Ibn Taymiyyah. Ibn Taymiyyah in the 1300s. And Ibn Taymiyyah was the one that defined Islam. And Ibn Taymiyyah said, in order to be a good Muslim, you must read the Quran as your authority, and you must apply that Quran in Muhammad's life. So you read the book, model by the man, the book and the man, the book and the man, the book and the man. That's how easy it is. That's all he said. Read the book, model the man. 200 years later, we had another man in Europe say much the same thing in Germany. His name was Martin Luther. Did he not say much the same thing? To be a good Christian, you must read the Bible modeled by Jesus Christ. Sola Scriptura, and Jesus is the model, the book and the man, the book and the man. We call that our Reformation. We're all part of the Reformationists. We are all protesters. That's why we call ourselves Protestants. We look at that as our great Reformation, and we're asking, when is Islam going to get its Reformation? And I'm saying it happened 200 years before we got ours. Because Ibn Taymiyyah is the one that everybody quotes. Two men in 1700, so now we're 400 years later, two men there in Medina were studying Ibn Taymiyyah's material. One was named Al-Wahhab, the other was named Al-Wahihullah. Al-Wahhab was from Arabia. He stayed in Arabia. He had studied Ibn Taymiyyah's material, realizing that you must go to the Quran, modeled by Muhammad, the book of the man, the book of the man. He stayed in Arabia. He amalgamated himself with the Ibn Saud family, who took over the entire uh, peninsula there. They then gave their name to this country that they created, eradicating all the tribes in front of them, and gave it the name Saudi Arabia. That's why we call it Saudi Arabia today. But they did not have theological legitimacy. In order to get theological legitimacy, they need to bring Wahhab on board and use him as their theologian. So that's where Wahhabism comes from, named after him. Wahhabism then brings the mosque and the state together. Wahhabism along with the Ibn Saud family. And that's why since the 1700s, Wahhabism has now been growing and growing and growing. So that in the 20th century and in the 21st century, Saudi Arabia starts transporting it out using petrodollars all over the world. And that's why you find Wahhabism all over the world. All based on Ibn Taymiyyah's teaching. The book of the man, the book of the man. Meanwhile, Wahihullah 
left Medina, went back to India where he had come from, went to Patna, which is in the eastern side of India, where my grandparents were, where my grandfather's uh, grave is. I'm a third generation Indian. He would, the, his disciples then co confronted the British when they came and colonized India, and they were a real thorn in the side of the British. So the British drove them right across North India over into the mountains up in the northwest, what is called Waziristan, their northwest frontier back then, and that's where they are today. These are all disciples of Waihuhula, who are all disciples of Ibn Taymiyyah. Are you following? Now let's talk about the last century, the 20th century. In the 20th century, there are two men in the Indian subcontinent whose names you need to know. One is Abdul al Maududi, and the other one is, is Muhammad Ilyas. Muhammad Ilyas, in 1926, started a group called the Tabikli Jamaat there in central India. Now, the Tabikli Jamaat is a group that's as radical as you can get. They are trying to take Muslims back to the Rashidun period, back to the period between 624 and 661, that 40-year period, which is the golden period of Islam, the beginning of the Caliphate with Muhammad. When he died in 632, then you have Abu Bakr for two years. When he dies in 634, then you have Umar for 10 years. When he dies in 644, then you have Uthman for 12 years. When he dies in 650, 654, then he dies, I'm sorry, 656, then you have Ali, who then rules for five years, and then he's killed by the, uh, the Sufyanis, um, uh, Muhawiyah, and started the beginning of the Umayyad Caliphate. So you have that 40-year period from 624 to 661. That's the Rashidun period. That's the golden era. And that's what all radical Muslims want us to go back to. The Al-Qaeda, the ISIS, Boko Haram, Al-Shabaab, and also the Tabikli Jamaat. They want to get us back to that golden era. The era of the six of the four rightly guided caliphs. That was started in 1926 by Muhammad Ilyas. That group has grown and grown and grown and grown. It's in 120 countries. It has a membership of 80 million. Let me repeat that. A membership of 80 million. How many of you know about this group? Very few of you. Yet this is the largest radical group in the world today. In Britain, much of most of our imams are trained by the Tapikli Jamaat, the Deobandis, the Deobandi movement, which came out of Maududi. Maududi was another man, Abdul Maududi, who was there in Deoband. He was actually he grew up not too far from where I grew up. And in 1947, when India got its independence, he moved then to Pakistan, Western Pakistan at that time, and started the Jamaat e Islami group. The Jamaat e Islami group then took over many of these madrasas all up in the northeastern frontier. These madrasas, thousands of these madrasas, where they're spewing out talibes every year. They're graduating 1.7 million of these talibes every year. 1.7 million of these talibes who are disciples. The talibes became the Taliban. The Taliban then moved into Afghanistan, threw off the Russians, and then now keep hold on right there. Let's go back to Egypt. Let's go over to the Middle East again. Because while this was all happening in the 1920s with, uh, with Maududi and also with Muhammad Ilyas, back in Egypt, over in Egypt, you have a man named Hassan al-Banna, who in the 1920s started another group called the Muslim Brotherhood, all based on Ibn Taymiyyah's teaching, which came through the Wahhabism. So he was using the same material that Wahhab had been teaching, going back to Ibn Taymiyyah, the same that, that Wa'iullah had been using in India, he was using there in Egypt. And he knew Maududi quite well. They would write back and forth. And he was created in the Muslim Brotherhood based on the same precepts that Ibn Taymiyyah had been teaching. His favorite student was a man named Said Qutb. Said Qutb had memorized the Quran by the time he was 10 years old. He became such a thorn in the side of the Egyptian government that in 1956 he was then in prison. And between 1956 and 1966, the 10 years he was in prison, he wrote two books. One was called In the Shade of the Quran and the other was called Milestones. Those are the two books that all radical Muslims read. And what he did is he went back to the Quran, he took this book, the Quran, and he went verse by verse by verse and exegeted it for the 20th century. That's why it's so dangerous. That's why Said Qutb, all my radical Muslim friends know about Said Qutb. It's been translated into most of the modern languages. You can go up and get it on, uh, up on the internet. That happened in 1966. He was then executed by Gimal Nasser because of the danger that he posed. His favorite student was a man named Ayman Zawahiri. Ayman Zawahiri had memorized the Quran by the time he was 15 years of age. 
He was then thrown out of Egypt, and he met a man, a guy that had an awful lot of money. He was a playboy, and he had an awful lot of money he didn't know what to do with. His name was Osama bin Laden. He came from the bin Laden family. So Ayman Zawahiri and Osama bin Laden decide to create together another group called Al-Qaeda. What does Al-Qaeda mean? The root, the base. The base of what? The base of Islam, going back to the root. They were no longer, they were not welcomed there in the Middle East because of their beliefs. And so suddenly a group over in Afghanistan, remember them, the Taliban? Invited them to come and set up shop in Afghanistan. Why? Because they already had this relationship with the Muslim Brotherhood. So they came and they set up shop in Afghanistan and they threw out the Russians. And then what did they do next? Well, you all know what they did next. They sent those four planes to attack your country here in the United States. September 11th, 2001. And that's where you call, came into the picture. And that's where you finally realized that there was a group of radical Muslims that confused you, that you'd never heard of before. And you probably said, well, maybe these are just a small aberration. Maybe they, these are just a small group. Maybe they don't really mean anything. Maybe they've just been around for about a hundred years. That's what I'm hearing in the church even today. In Britain, we wanted to do a survey. So they did a survey looking at all the Muslims there in Britain. And I, the month after 9-11, they did a survey to find out where Muslims stood, whether or not they supported Al-Qaeda. And they found that 15% on this side believed and supported Al-Qaeda and supported what they were doing. The vast majority were in the middle, 70%. They did not understand Al-Qaeda. They were threatened by them. They were nominal Muslims. And then the last 15% would have been liberal Muslims over here on the left. So 15, 70, 15. That was in 2001, October of 2001. The next year, in 2002, they did the same survey again. They wanted to find out what had changed. And they had found that this group that had been 15% had grown to 25% in just one year. They did another survey in 2006, asking the same questions. Do you support Al-Qaeda? Do you support this radical agenda? Do you support Sharia law? And this group that had been 15, that had grown to 25%, now was 43% by 2006. 43%. Almost half the Muslims in Britain had moved to the right. Now, all over the newspapers, this was a huge, a huge problem because obviously there's a, there a difficulty. How could so many people be moving towards radical Islam? And of course, the response was, oh, it was because of Iraq and Afghanistan. It was because of geopolitical problems. But see, we were talking to these people. These are the guys I work with. And they were just proliferating all around us. Any given Sunday, come to Speaker's Corner and you can meet them. We were there last Sunday. I won't be there next Sunday. I'll be here. But they're there. And you talk to them as to why they become radicalized. And they'll say the same narrative. We get the same narrative. Whenever we feel threatened, which they do right now, where do we go? We go back to the book. We go back to the man. We go back to the Quran. We go back to Muhammad. We look to see what Muhammad did when he was threatened. When he was threatened by the Jews there in Medina in 624 and 625. What did he do in 624? He threw out the Banu Kainuka family. What did he do in 625? He threw out the Banu Nadir family. What did he do in 627, three, two, uh, five years after his movement to Medina? The Banu Koreza family, the last remaining Jewish tribe, he took all 800 men and slit their throats in one afternoon. Took all the women as concubines for his men and the children as slaves. How many of you know this story? You can read it in Imani Sham, al wikidi Al-Buhari, Sahih Muslim, Al-Tabri. I've given you five sources in three different genres of Islamic traditions. You can read this story. See, why haven't you been taught this? Because none of you study Islam. But all my radical Muslim friends know this. They know exactly what Muhammad did when he was threatened. After 624, he used the sword. And that's why from 624 to 632, he was involved in 29 battle campaigns of his own, and he planned another 33. His whole life was replete with violence. Raid after raid after raid after raid. They call it the Maghazi documents. They even have a name. It's called the raids. See, all my radical friends know this. Why don't you know it? Because you're not taught this. No one will teach this at schools here. They won't teach this in your seminaries or your Bible school. They're not even teaching in your high schools. You're not permitted to know this side of Muhammad's life. You're not asked to read his biography. Just read his biography. Don't read before you go to bed, though. It's not pleasant reading, especially when he moved to Medina. Just open the Quran. 
Read the Medina surahs, verse after verse after verse. Slay the unbeliever wherever ye find them. Surah 9, ayah 5. Make war on the people of the book. Surah 9, ayah 29. Make war on the, those who are fitna. So there will be no more unbelief until there is no more fitna in the land. Cut off the heads of the unbeliever. Surah 47, ayah 4. And he who participates page in jihad, if he should die, great shall be his, his reward, for he shall be in paradise. Verse 6, verse 5 and 6 of Surah 47. That's the verse that gives them a, the only verse exact out of two that gives them, well, gives any Muslim that dies in the cause of Allah an assurance of salvation. Folks, this book is full of violence, but it's all in the Medinan surahs, which come after 624, after 622, really. And see, most of us haven't learned that. We haven't been taught that. We have no idea what Muhammad did with his wives. We had no idea what Muhammad did with women, what he did with children, what he did with men, what he did with communities, what he did with the pagans, what he did with those who stood against him, and especially what he did with those who rejected him. See, you need to be taught this material because you're hearing a, nat a narrative that Muhammad is a man of peace, are you not? You're hearing that the, Bible, the Quran is a book of peace, are you not? You're hearing that Islam is a religion of peace. Is that what you're hearing? Next time you hear that, ask any Muslim, can you show me one verse in the Quran that says you're to have peace with me, a Christian? Just ask him. I've been asking that for 33 years. There's no verse that says they're to have peace with me. With other Muslims, yes, but not with me. Not with the Al-Kitab. In fact, you have just the opposite. Surah 5, Ayah 51. Have nothing to do with the, uh, with the Ali Kitab, for they are awliya of one another. They are friends of, no, of one another. And he who is a friend of them is one of them. They're not to have friendships with us. That's why you need to go back to the book. And you need to go back to the man. The book and the man, the book and the man. But then you need to introduce the antidote. And that's where we come in. See, don't expect the secular world to understand what I'm saying today. This is not found in any manual. This is not found in any government manual. You're not going to find it in any theological school. I'm sorry, not theological, any uh, governmental schools. You're not going to find it in any universities in Britain. I'm sure it's not here in the United States either. Nobody is taught to go back and read what motivates these radicals to do what they're doing. Why is it so many of them are moving to the right? Why is so many? We have 2,000 now who have joined the ISIS group from Britain alone, another 2,000 are in prison because they wanted to join. That's 4,000 that we know of. Those are only the ones we know of. Guess how many Muslims we have in our military? 450. What does that tell you? There is a movement to the right, whether we like it or not. And the reason why so many of them are becoming radicalized is because they're finally going back and reading their Quran. And they're going back and reading the prophet's life. So who's going to confront that book and that man? Don't wait for your government to do it. They dare not do it. Tony Blair used to be our prime minister. He used to get up in public and he used to say over and over again, I've read the Quran three times through and all I see is peace and tolerance. Which Quran is he talking about? <laughs> but he's a politician. He has to say that. Because he has a whole constituency that is, he's responsible to. And he knows if he were ever to say what he had read, there would be vigilantism in the very next day, and he would be asked, every ambassador from every Muslim nation will pull their ambassadors out and demand that he apologize publicly. That's why you're not going to find any politician say anything against the Quran. You saw what happened in the Denmark cartoons. You saw what happened with Charlie Hebdo in France. And you saw what happened to the editors of those Charlie Hebdos. You get killed for saying that. So don't expect any of your politicians to say what they know. They dare not. They cannot. That's not their remit. They're elected into office by a constituency, and they have to support, be supported by that constituency. Don't wait for the police or the military. You said they can't confront radical Islam, because how can a military confront a book and a man? How do you confront that ideology that's based on that book? You cannot confront an ideology with bombs, bullets, and cruise missiles. Never been done. You can control it, maintain it, yes, even move it, but you cannot destroy it. You can destroy ISIS tomorrow, another will pop up and take over another name. They will keep popping up all the time because of that book and that man. So don't wait for the military to do it. 
You can't wait for the politicians to do it. What about the pundits? What about the academics? They could. In fact, it's the academics that we're using the most. But the academics dare not use this publicly. Dr. Patricia Corona was very clear that she didn't even want the Muslims to read her material because she already had a death threat. She knew what that was like. So who's left? Well, the only way I know how to take out an ideology based on a book and a man is with another ideology based on another book and another man. Who do you think I'm talking about? And what do you think I'm talking about? I'm making it as easy as I can for you all. <laughs> See, they've got this book here, but look how small and infantile it is. I even had it upside down for a while. We've got a bigger book, a better book. This is the only book that's going to destroy that book. And that's why we are the only ones that can do this battle. This is really our remit, because we have no constituency that we're responsible to accept Jesus Christ. We have only one person that we obey, and he's the man who stands against Muhammad. And that's why this is our remit. This is our battle. This is what we are going to have to do. The church is going to have to fight this battle. And I'm a Mennonite. I'm a pacifist. Can you imagine me using these kind of words? But I realize as a pacifist, I cannot use bomb bullets and cruise missiles. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 10, for we do not use weapons of this world. What does he say next? We use principalities and power. And then what does he say in verse 5? We use arguments. And we take every idea and make it captive to Jesus Christ. That's what we do. We use arguments. No, put away your sword. Peter, for he who lives by the sword dies by the sword. We're not allowed to use the sword. The one time the sword was used, Jesus refused to accept it in Matthew chapter 26. He would not allow even his disciples to defend him with a sword. We're not permitted to use swords, folks. Not that kind of sword. We're to use arguments and take captive every thought and make it obedient to Jesus Christ, which means we're going to have to confront the Quran and we're going to have to confront Muhammad. And there's a few of us that are going to have to do that. And I'm not asking all of you to do that. I'm only asking for a few of you. We have some here already. Nabil Quraysh is doing that. David Wood is doing that. James White is doing that. Sam Shamoon. I don't know of anybody better than Sam Shamoon who's doing that. And he's right here at this conference. I don't know if he's in the room right now. But he is the one that's probably doing more damage than anybody else. I'm doing that in Europe. We have others like Samuel Green. We have Tony Costa. We have three girls on my team that are all doing that. I can't get any guys to join me on the ladder. I can only get three girls to get up on the ladder with me. Did you, isn't that odd? In 24 years, I'm leaving in October, coming back here to the States, and I'm leaving three girls behind to do all my work for me. God has blessed these three girls with an amazing capacity. Beth Grove from England. We have also from England, Sarah Foster, though she's Jamaican lineage. And then we have Hatun Tash from Turkey. And these three girls, if you go up on Fander Films, just look at the videos up there, and you can see they're getting, they're getting up on the ladder with me every week. And we're using them to confront the Quran, to confront Muhammad, to confront Allah. Those are the three things we confront every week. We don't waste our time on other things. We're also confronting Islamic law. We're confronting the Sunnah of the Prophet. We've just confronted slavery in Islam. And we've just confronted apostasy last week. And everything we do, we now film and put it up on Defender Films. And we're finding we're getting more people watching those films than any other thing. And we're getting people who are coming to the Lord. But we have some people on our team who are going into mosques every day of the week. Sometimes, well, not every day, about four days a week. We're going right into the mosque. And they're going and saying, we're going to study the Quran with you. And we're going to study the Bible, but we're going to confront your Quran, and we want you to defend it. They get thrown out, and they go right back in again. They get thrown out, and they go right back in again. We have one person on our team who has now, who has now won 125 Muslims to Jesus Christ in just the last year, using polemics. Using polemics. Using this historical material. She has brought three imams to the Lord, one just before Christmas, using polemics. Yet we're not taught to do this, and there's not any school that teaches you to do this. Nowhere in the world to teach you to do this. Well, there is one. We're now teaching people around the world. 
We've decided rather than go all over the world and go, because I'm called all over the world to go and teach us in many different universities, I'm sorry, in many seminaries, the problem is nobody can know that I'm coming because if I name Gigogo gets there, the Muslims hear about it, they're going to confront that seminary. So I go and quietly do my teaching and then leave. Quietly do my teaching and leave. But we've come up with a much better plan, and that is to teach it from London. So we now have a new course called the Founder, this is called the Founder Foundation course. And this is taught from September to July every year. 42 lessons. The first 14 start from September and they go through December. This is Islam 101. Everything you need to know about Islam. This is for people that don't yet know or people that do know but want to learn more about it. And this goes from December, I'm sorry, uh, September to January. And then in January, we go from January to April, this is all apologetics, all the questions and how to answer them. Myriads of questions. Looking at 24 years of experience, we now are able to teach all this. And then the last 14 weeks is from April to July. We're in the middle, we're almost ending that right now. This is the last 14 weeks. This is the more damaging material. This is the more advanced material. So it's 42 lessons, 84 hours, but we, we teach it for every Wednesday night from 6 to 8 o'clock, and then we have half an hour of questions at, in London. But we're teaching this all over the world using webinar, Zoom webinar, which means you don't even have to come to London. We come to you. We come right onto your laptop. We come right into your laptop, take it over, and our PowerPoint, you just sit back and watch the video while the PowerPoint changes right in front of you. You can't even control the PowerPoint. We control it from London. Now, you may not be there live to watch it, so therefore we send it to you the next day on Thursday. So it doesn't matter what country you're in, we can teach you now this new material. All this material that we've learned in London for the last 24 years that's not taught anywhere else, we've decided to teach the Christian church. These are only for Christians. This is not for Muslims. This is only for Christians. That's why I can say it openly here at this conference. But we're finding now we're, up, we're in 15 countries this year. We're in 85 students from all over. And we're finding that every one of the students is now using this material. And for the first time, they're going on the offense. Now, I have to be careful. I'm not asking any of you to go on the offense. Because if you're going to go on the offense, you better know Islam very well. But every one of you can go on the defense. Every one of you can be apologist. Every one of you can talk about Jesus Christ. Every one of you can talk about his crucifixion and resurrection. And every one of you can defend your scriptures. And the beautiful thing about Muslims is that's all they want to talk about anyways. Isn't, aren't they great? I go on to university campus, and I go up to a secular student, I say, I want to talk about Jesus Christ, I believe he's the word of God, I, I, he's the son of God, and I believe that the Bible is the word of God, you have an opinion, they usually turn around and walk away, and usually say something not too nice about Jesus Christ as they're walking away, but you say that to any Muslim, and you know that you're going to have a discussion, and usually, usually they invite you out for coffee, and they pay for it. <laughs> they're the easiest people in the world to talk about Jesus. And you're going to be doing what Paul did. See, I love Paul, and maybe we can end with him. Paul is the one that I like the best, because Paul, look and see what he did between chapter 17 and chapter 19 of Acts. Take a look at Paul. Everywhere he went, in Berea, Cappadocia, there in Laodicea, there in Ephesus, in every city he went, he went right into the synagogues. He confronted the Jews with what they had done to the Messiah. They threw him out. Sometimes they threw him into jail. In Acts 19, it says that after three months, they got fed up with him. So he took off the sandals from his shoes, his feet, and he dusted off the sandals, went down to the lecture hall of, of Tyrannus, and for two years he preached the gospel. The lecture hall of Tyrannus is a debating chamber. So that the whole land heard the gospel, it says in Acts 19. Ooh, that's my Paul. That's why I love Paul. But where are our Pauls today? Oh, I've got three of them. Paulines. I'm still looking for my Pauls. We need to have Pauls and Paulines to go and be willing to go into the mosques. And yes, to confront them like Paul confronted them. You're not going to be killed unless you're an apostate. I have been doing this for 24 years. I'm still here. I've got two angels, Harry and Larry. God's going to go give you all two angels. You name your own ones. Don't use my names. But the great thing about this is this is nothing new. This is exactly what was done in the early church. And I'm going to leave with you now the commissioning of the 12. See, in 
Matthew 10, Jesus commissions the 12 disciples. But look at the commissioning that he commissions them with. He says to the 12 disciples, I'm sending you out as lamb before wolves. You're going to be hated for preaching the gospel. You're going to be persecuted for preaching the gospel. You're going to be jailed for preaching the gospel. You're going to be flogged for preaching the gospel. You're going to be killed. How many of you, when you were commissioned, were commissioned like that? Yet that's exactly how Jesus commissioned the 12 disciples. Hated persecuted, jailed, flogged, killed. Every one of the disciples was hated, were they not? Every one of the disciples was, yes, they were jailed. Every one of the disciples was hated. They were all flogged, and every one of the disciples was killed, except for John. They were all killed, except for John. They received their commissioning. Why should our commissioning be any different? Especially now that we're up, faced up against another enemy that is as big and buried, larger, much larger than whatever the early church had, and they are as passionate as we are. This is our time. This is our day. See, we're dealing with people that believe in the book and a man. But we're the only ones that have the antidote. A bigger book. A bigger man. This is what's going to destroy Islam. You've seen what we've already shared with you this, uh, uh, this conference. We've seen how we can destroy Muhammad very quickly in the emergence of Islam, just using the most neutral in the material, and that's called historical criticism. You saw this afternoon how we can now destroy the Quran using the most neutral material, just looking at their manuscripts, and we can destroy them easily. You saw what happened two days ago when we debated one of the scholars here in the uh, United States, one of the top reformed scholars. He was absolutely hopeless. He could not go back to that book. Not that book. He had to change that book, completely ameliorate it, completely sanitize it, so that it would be relevant for Arizona in the 21st century. Thank God we don't have to do that with the Bible. What a book, and what a man, and what a time for this book and that man. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for who you are. We want to thank you, Lord, that you do love us. You did come to earth. You did enter time and space. You had no problem entering time and space, unlike the Arab God, unlike the Muslim God, who is incapable of doing what you could do. We thank you, God, that you did that. Not just the 2,000 years ago. You did it from the very beginning. And all the way through history, you have been coming to earth. But Lord, when you did 2,000 years ago, you did it for a reason. You came to save every one of us. And our Muslim brothers and sisters in Christ, they need to hear this message. They need to get away from their man, their book, and come on home to our man, to our book, to you and what you gave. Lord, help us to be, have that courage that the early church had. Help us to have courage that the disciples had and that Paul had. And Lord, help us to have that type of resilience and help us to know exactly how to introduce your gospel into every venue, into every situation, into every discussion, because you win every debate. Thank you for what you've already done. And may we see you start to infill every one of us with your spirit, your vision, and with your kingdom. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.